Okay. We should get us get to start. Um, apologize for the delay. We were previous group was delayed getting in as well. It's a real pleasure to have Rami as today's Burke speaker. The Burke seminar series normally brings people in from all over the world to tell us about the latest advances in medical imaging, but often we forget that we have world experts here in our midst. So from time to time we bring in some of our own to tell us what they're doing because let's face it, um, we hear Rami at international meetings all the time but seldom in our own backyard. So Ravi received his BSc in Physics from UBC and a Master's in Medical Physics at McGill. And I was lucky enough to have him in my lab at McGill. He still complains that I didn't pay him while he was doing his Master's, but I just treat that as a learning, as a character building experience. So, <laughs> um, anyway, his time at McGill was followed up, followed by a PhD at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. And then he went to University of Minnesota as a postdoc to work with fMRI pioneers um, Seiji Ogawa and Kamel Ergebel. Rabbi came back to Robards in 1994 to work with Canada's first high field magnet, the 4 magnet at that time. And he started the Center for Functional and Metabolic uh, Mapping, um, CFMM, here at Robards. The center now has, houses Canada's only seven Tesla magnets, so keeping ahead of the game. And I believe that Rabbi has the longest record of anyone in the field in working with high field magnets. Probably. <laughs> so Rami Rav is currently Canada Research Chair in Functional MRI and has been a recipient of many awards over the years, including having been named in the top 40 under 40 in 2002. So now push his current age. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't 10 when that happened. Uh, he's a senior fellow, fellow of the International Society of Magnetic Resonance and Medicine, and he's a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Research. So Ravi's research continues to push the boundaries of MRI, particularly with tools available through the high field imaging. So today he's going to tell us about using these tools to probe structure and function. Thanks very much, Terry, and thanks for the uh, invitation to speak. Yeah, it was a character building experience. Uh, so. <laughs> So you students who complain about what you get paid, well, when you're paid zero and you have to take the summers off to earn enough money to come back to school, then you can complain. <laughs> so, uh, but I had a terrific time in, in Terry's lab, and uh, uh, certainly lots of great things came of it. So uh, the work I'm going to talk to you today about are two little snippets of, of what we do in the lab. Uh, they are funded by these agencies and a large part of the sort of underlying uh, physics and, and software and hardware is done by these three guys. So in case I don't make it to the end, I wanted to put that up at the beginning. Uh, we started off with 14T Magnet back in 1996 when it arrived. Uh, we now have three high field scanners. And the important thing about MRI um, as a general tool is, A, it's not very sensitive, so it kind of sucks that way, but B, the signal that you do get can be manipulated in many different ways that are reflective of various tissue properties. Almost everything we do in my lab, well, everything we do in my lab is, is neural. Uh, and so it's various properties of gray, white, gray matter and white matter that can be manipulated in terms of pulse sequence to generate different contrasts. So you can make uh, an image of the blood vessels. Uh, these are the arteries. These are the veins. Uh, this is a uh, flare sequence showing some MS lesions. These are actually all the same brain, but different contrasts. So this is. This is very different than those of you who do image processing, where you might say, OK, I'll take a lookup table for this uh, image, which shows gray-white contrast, gray-gray, and white is black, and then flip it around. That's not actually what we do with MRI. We can actually change the sensitivity of the pulse sequence and change the contrast that way. So, Imaging at high fields uh, has many potential advantages, and it has one very significant problem. And that is the radio frequency and homogeneity is really dominant at these high fields. 
distance. And I won't go into a lot of details, but it boils down to the fact that the wavelength of the radio frequency in your brain at 7T is comparable to the size of your brain. So you're essentially sending up, setting up standing waves, kind of like a drum beat. Okay, and you can't just collect the, correct that with the post-processing because it actually affects the contrast that you get. So this is a T1-weighted image, and you can see because of the inhomogeneity in the sort of visual cortex here um, that you lose contrast. So and you can't just recover that with image manipulation, so it's gone. So you have to put a lot of effort, and that's what our insert program uh, for many years has been uh, aimed at. Developing various coils, both for non-human primates and for human primates, uh, to actually get around this. And I'll just give you a flavor of that. I'm not going to dwell on this. And the idea is, if you use a traditional birdcage coil, which is used in a hospital MRI scanner and, and often um, on all 3T scanners, uh, you get this inhomogeneous image when you try to use it at 7T. But what if you could sort of deconstruct that? What if you had eight little coils whose amplitudes and phases of the RF you could actually manipulate in some manner? Then it is possible to actually come up with a solution where you can homogenize the image by adjusting the signal in each of these little coils. This is a concept called parallel transmit. And conceptually, it's very simple. But in practice, there are a lot of issues about how you actually combine this. So there are two steps to do this. So Martin Clausen spent a lot of time over the years developing mapping sequences for the transmit RF field. So this is called B1 plus mapping. Won't go into the details of it. But once you have a map of each individual coil's transmit profile, then you have to combine them in some way. And so Andrew Curtis, who was a PhD student of mine, now works for Synaptive, uh, spent a lot of time working on algorithms that allow you to combine uh, the transmit profiles to get the most homogeneous image. And rather than going through the details of the technique, I think for the moment, and so that we try to finish on time, uh, take a look at these axial, sagittal, and coronal slices of a typical 7T image done with something that can do a birdcage and take a look at what happens once you can homogenize this with parallel transmit. So this is a fairly significant uh, issue to deal with. Uh, we are the only lab in the world who actually does all our acquisitions at 17 with parallel transmit. And that's important because you can always image a few slices in the brain and make them look homogeneous. And that's what most people at 17 do, even to this day. We actually do whole brain studies because we do a lot of clinical translation and physicians would like to see everything from the bottom of the cerebellum to the top of your head. And so we actually view parallel transmit as an essential component of being able to scan the high fields. So that's all I'm going to talk about for, for coils, but just to remind you that there's an enormous amount of engineering that goes into the biology and the neuroscience that I'm going to talk about. So let's move on to MS a little bit and talk about how MS is diagnosed. So MRI has been used in the diagnosis of MS since the mid-1980s, and it's actually an essential component of the diagnosis of MS. So typically what will happen is you'll, you'll have blurry vision, or you might have some weakness in, in your hand, and you'll go see your GP, and she or D will try to uh, eliminate a few things like concussions and so on, and then they'll send you for an MRI. And your MRI might come back like this. So this is a T2 weighted, sorry, a flare sequence. This is a T2 weighted sequence, the T1 weighted sequence. And you see some bright spots or dark spots depending upon the contrast. That's not MS. That's called clinically isolated syndrome. Okay, so they'll use an image like this to rule out a few things like a tumor or a stroke or things like that. But then they'll send you home. And they'll say, come back when you have symptoms again. So sometime between six months and 20 years later, you will have symptoms again. And you will come back, and they will do another MRI, and it may come up, there we go, and it may look like that. 
So the two obvious things to notice are the lesions have moved in space. And of course, they've changed over time. So these are the so-called McDonald criteria for the diagnosis of MS. This is what a radiologist will use. It's called dissemination in space and dissemination in time, which are just fancy ways of saying that it has, the dots have to move over time. OK, so this becomes MS. You can see a problem with this, because the McDonald criteria require you to wait so while you wait, the disease is progressing. And if you didn't have MS while you wait, whatever else you had is also progressing. So this is a problem in terms of the early diagnosis. And you're not going to go on medications, many of which are extremely effective these days, until you get that MS diagnosis. So the fundamental problem is this takes time, and time is brain. That's true in stroke, it's true in MS, it's true in lots of things. Second problem with MS is what we call the clinical radiologic paradox. That is the fact that if you look at all these lesions and you add up their volume or their number, uh, none of those quantities actually correlate well with the behavioral or motor symptoms, nor do any of those quantities predict the progression of the disease. So it'll tell you that somebody ultimately has MS. It won't tell you how that's going to progress, um, nor does the imaging actually correlate well with the scales that are used in MS, particularly the EDSS scale, the Extended Disability Scale. So, if you're trying to look for a solution, uh, I always tell students to go look far back in time because somebody probably figured it out already. In this case, you have to go back about 150 years. So, Jean-Martin Charcot, who was the uh, neurologist who first described MS and ALS and a number of other diseases, noted in, in post-mortem studies that there were changes in the structure of myelin. They were loss of axons in the brains. There was this um, unusual accumulation of iron uh, in the areas of the brain that had the sclerosis. Uh, and in fact, there was gray matter damage. So all of this was known 150 years ago. But we didn't have tools to actually see a lot of that until very recently. So a little bit of simple biology for those who aren't familiar. So the brain has lots of functionally specialized areas. I've just picked two here uh, that, in fact, are connected through the corpus callosum with an axon, or many axons, in fact. So this is what it looks like. So in this yellow circle, we've got the cell bodies of the neurons, and then they project to other cell bodies of other neurons here. And we have these myelinated uh, axons, which speed up transmission. And in multiple sclerosis, what happens is, so there's a lesion there, what you expect is some form of either partial or complete uh, demyelination of the axon. This happens sometimes on and off, so they may remyelinate or they may not. And depending upon what happens, you get different forms of progression of the disease. So you either get a, a primary progressive, so that's very bad. You start with MS and it goes downhill. You have relapsing remitting, so you have a few, day, few bad days a year um, on and off for many years. That may persist for the rest of your life, or it might go into a secondary progressive decline. Uh, so knowing the, the trajectory of the disease by trying to image would be a very useful thing. So what does this look like in an electron microscope? So here is a beautifully myelinated axon. It's got about 10 wraps, and it looks good. But here are a bunch of axons where the myelin has become very loose and flaky. Okay. So typically these are you know, any 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 microns in diameter. So to scale, uh, this would be uh, maybe a centimeter or so. 
So this is um, not Luxalflas blue, but it's a similar stain that, that stains for myelin lipids. And what you can see is a, a sclerosis or a lesion which has completely devoid of myelin. It has a vein, in fact, in the middle of it. We'll come back to that. And then it's surrounded by this area of, of still intact myelin. You can stain with other things. This is a stain uh, for iron. And what you can see is in the lesion, again, this is about a centimeter across, uh, you see iron around the vessel, a vein. You also see iron, uh, sort of higher iron density around the periphery of the lesion. And again, to scale, there's that electron micrograph. And that iron comes not from just heme iron being deposited. That's actually iron that is present in the macrophages. So if you can track iron, you can actually track what the immune response is doing. So this puts it all together to scale. So there's my electron micrograph. There's my lesion that is size matched to the lesion you see in the brain. And the problem is, how do we get from a traditional MRI image to be sensitive to these kinds of parameters, so iron or demyelination? So that's a challenge. But even when you can't resolve something in MRI, the signal intensity can still be reflective of the contrast uh, of the microstructure that is in the brain. So you can manipulate the imaging contrast or the post-processing that you do with these to actually tell you something about the microstructure even when you can't visualize it directly. So I'll show you examples both of directly visualizing this as well as inferring uh, microstructure. So is the ability to do in vivo histology, histology translatable to, uh, to humans? Um, possibly, and I'll show you evidence for that at uh, 7T. Uh, just to put this in perspective, 3T, uh, there are about 6,000 of those in the world now. That is the standard for, for clinical care. Still lots and lots of one and a half T scanners, at least 20,000 of them. Um, well, the 7T and 9.4T are very rare, both for human and animals. Uh, 7T, there are about 60 human systems in the world, about 20 animal systems at 9.4, and three human systems at 9.4. So much rarer. So we're actually going to use the very simplest pulse sequence ever invented in MRI, which is the gradient recall echo. This is one of the first imaging sequences <laughs> Um, and it's an oldie but a goodie. There's a lot of information in there if you understand the sequence. So this is our workhorse for everything I'm going to show you. And the idea is this. So we do a multi-echo sequence. Uh, so we have different echo times, as they're called, which allows us to track the signal decay <coughs> over time. So here is whole brain. This is the third echo, and this is the sixth echo of a six-echo sequence. You can take any voxel here and fit it over time. So this might be something like uh, 30 milliseconds. This might be something like 60 milliseconds. And we can plot a decay curve from that. But MRI is not just magnitude. So CT, ultrasound, every other imaging modality is a magnitude image that comes back. MRI is a complex valued function. It has magnitude and phase. And the phase allows you to measure frequency. So we do this all the time in MRI. We measure a map of the frequency across the whole object that you're imaging. And the reason we do that is, is we want to optimize our magnetic field imaging. And those maps look like this. So this is, again, starting right at the top of the motor cortex, but all the way down to the cerebellum. You can see it's about 500 hertz variation after you shim. So you put the person in the magnet, you make maps like this, you add currents to shims, and you try to make things as homogeneous as possible. But that actually isn't the end of the story. It turns out that if you take this field map, and it's got some complex cuts, so you can unwrap, you have these pi wraps in phase, so you can make the thing homogeneous, then you can remove sort of this global offset in field. 
Okay, it's a slowly spatial varying offset. Um, spectroscopists like to make this as homogeneous as possible, and for echoplanar imaging, we want to do the same thing. But if you take this global field shift out, you can actually see that there's structure in here. It looks like a brain with gray and white matter contrast. So this is what we call the local field shift. It's very much smaller, uh, about 10 hertz, plus or minus 10 hertz. And it arises because the local microscopic fields in the gray matter and the white matter and the basal ganglia and so on are all subtly different from each other. So this is a novel tissue contrast, which has not traditionally been used. If you have a 3D map of frequencies, you can actually do a dipole inversion and you can produce a map of susceptibility. It's actually an underdetermined problem because of something called the magic angle, but you can do a reasonable job of actually mapping that. So this is a map, a quantitative map, of susceptibility values in the brain in one particular slice. Just to show you that somebody with MS has lesions that pop out in something like this. You can see them there as well. So this is not what would traditionally be used. So uh, Igor and Bryson in the lab developed a pipeline which takes all the images from the multiple received coils that you have. We have 32 on our 70 system. Uh, we unwrap the frequency to get a local field map. Um, and also we have these magnitude images for each of the echoes. We can combine these to look at really nice maps of the veins. Um, or we can use quantitative information to measure R2 star, which is the inverse of T2 star, or the susceptibility. And of course, we can overlay both of these quantitative um, maps on top of traditional MRI images. So from this very old sequence, we can actually get two very new quantities, which are the apparent transverse relaxation rate which is sensitive to myelin and iron, and we can get the susceptibility, which is also sensitive to myelin and iron. And I say that like, you know, you should know that. In fact, that's not necessarily known, and I'll show you how we prove that. So that work was done by David Rutko, uh, who was a PhD student in my lab. David actually uh, just became an assistant professor at McGill, where he did a postdoc for uh, 14 months. Uh, and he will be leading their 7T initiative. So what did David do that was so cool? Well, quite a few things, actually. I can't talk about all of them, but I'll mention a few. So this was uh, a paper that proved the origin of the MRI signal contrast. So this was published in PNAS a couple years ago. And the idea, again, is simple, but the devil's in the details. So we 3D printed um, a little holder that allowed us to take rat brains and image them in any 3D orientation we wanted. And what David did was show that in the white matter, so I don't know if you can see the blue and red arrows, so those, those are two white matter tracks. As you rotated the rat brain, you got an orientation dependence on both the local field and the R2 star. And that was expected. I've been known for a long time that white matter, because it's oriented, has an orientation dependence on both relaxation times and susceptibility values. What was not known was the fact that even in gray matter, so in the cortex, there was an orientation dependence. In retrospect, this shouldn't be so surprising. Gray matter has layers. Uh, depending on where you are, up to six. But additionally, um, gray matter has myelinated axons coming into it. And that myelin, those myelinated axons, confer an orientation uh, dependence as well. So we model this, um, model both the R2 star and, and the susceptibility. And using the values from that model, we compared them with stains for iron, so this is a dab pearl stain, and this is Lexol Fast Blue, in both white matter and in gray matter. 
And the take home from this was we were able to show that the susceptibility in R2 star values measured with this multi-echo gradient echo sequence I talked about mapped very nicely to the iron content and the myelin content in the rat brains. So this showed that those quantities that we measure actually have a physical realization in terms of two things that are quite interesting in MS, okay, so iron and myelin. So then we started to look at this in patients. So a group of 25 patients with um, either clinically isolated syndrome or relapsing remitting MS. Remember, CIS is not MS. It's probable MS, essentially. Um, but actually, only 50% of people with CIS go on to get an MS diagnosis, which is why you don't give everybody drugs to begin with. Age and sex match. Uh, age, because iron deposition in your brain depends on how old you are. Everybody can tell my brain when we do these studies because I have the oldest brain in the lab. So you get the darkest spots. Um, sex match because MS uh, affects women about three times more often than it affects men. Okay. So we looked at these quantities that we can measure, the iron and, and myelin, uh, and compared them with the EDSS scale uh, amongst other things. So these are group averages of the controls and the patients. So let's just look at the top and the bottom. So these are the R2 star values. These are relaxation times we're measuring from the decay of the multi-echo gradient sequence. And you actually don't need statistics to see the differences. So you can see that the R2 star values in patients are higher than they are in controls. So these areas in the base of the caudate, putamen, they are brighter. So their R2 star is higher, their decay time is shorter. Similarly, if you look in the susceptibility images, so look back here in the optic radiations. So they're very dark in normal subjects, and that's because there's a lot of myelin. Myelin is diamagnetic, and so on this scale, diamagnetic is dark. And here in the patients, you can see you know, without doing any statistics whatsoever, that the optic radiations are less diamagnetic. That means they have less amide. Okay. So you'd be more scientific about this, of course. You can look at the differences in R2 star um, between the two groups. So this is um, patients relative to healthy controls. And you see all these sort of nonspecific white matter tracts all over colosum in various places that are demyelinating. That's an R2 star. You can also do this with quantitative susceptibility. So here you see why having both parameters is important. So in the basal ganglia, we actually see increases in the susceptibility. And those are associated with increases in iron was we see decreases in the white matter susceptibility uh, because those are associated with less myelin. Okay? Remember that we're differencing here. So for the first time ever, people, we, were able to show that both R2 star and the susceptibility values correlated with the EDSS. So this is the disability scale, which is mostly weighted towards motor function, but there's some cognitive aspects as well. The red X's are what the healthy controls look like. So they have an EDSS that is zero, of course, no disability, and these would be baseline healthy values. So this is, and they're very strong. I mean, these for biology, having 0.5 and 0.7 correlation values is, is extremely surprising um, and very strong. So this is for deep gray matter structures, for both susceptibility and for R2 star. So we have a measure that now correlates. This is in white matter. Um, it turns out that susceptibility is more sensitive than R2 star, both in gray and white matter. So if you just add all the groups together, uh, all the patients together, and you don't segment out their lesions, 
you have this very striking dependence of the susceptibility value on EDSS and very modest, very poor um, correlation uh, with R2 star. And even if you take all the lesions out, this is what you see. You see a very strong dependence of the susceptibility again on the disability score. And that's very important because in MS, there's this concept of normal appearing white matter, which is used as sort of the control for all MS studies. And what this says is there is no such thing as normal appearing white matter. Even if you can't see uh, some form of intensity variation in a traditional clinical image, the susceptibility values are telling you that there is demyelination. So that concept is not valid, and that's why this was published in radiology. Um, so this really, I think, changes the paradigm of, of how we think about MS and how we think about controls in MS, because people have been using normal appearing white matter as the control. You pick some region where you don't see any change, and you reference everything to that, and that's clearly not valid. So Charcot and some of the pathology I showed you pointed out that MS is a venous-centric disease. So we reviewed this a few years ago, we being Marcelo Kremichetsky, who was director of the MS clinic, my student Matt Quinn. And uh, we looked at 150 years worth of literature, which suggested that one way to diagnose MS early is to find lesions that have central veins in them. Because other forms of hyperintensities or hypointensities, depending upon your sequence, uh, don't have those central veins. So if you could see central veins, you can make a diagnosis of MS right at the first visit. And that would save a lot of time. And since time is brain, you can start putting people on sort of the classical or new treatments and actually halt or come very close to halting the progression of the disease. Because some of these very new drugs are extremely good at doing that. So let's look at this again at, at 70. Um, so this is a T1 weighted image, and there's a lesion, and I've just blown it up for you. Uh, here is a great recall echo image, and here's the same lesion. I've blown it up. You can maybe see a little bit of structure in that if you squint. Um, and this is a flare image, uh, so T2 weighted flare. So these are the standard clinical sequences that would be acquired. And you see pretty much a homogeneous lesion. But if you look at R2 star, or you look at the local frequency, or you look at the susceptibility, it should be just absolutely pop out at you that there is a central vein going through this lesion. So even at the first visit, we would actually predict that somebody who had this kind of a structure has MS. We wouldn't have to wait six months or five years. The median is about five years for conversion, or 20 years, which is kind of the 90th percentile. And that's just by having resolution and having contrast. So susceptibility goes up with field strength. So that's a big benefit of, of the field. And of course, because we have a lot more signal and noise, we can image at higher resolution. So we've been doing uh, some very expensive long-term studies looking at longitudinal cohorts, imaging people every four months uh, for many years. And what happens is you typically will see a region pop up, and you can retrospectively go back in time and look at the MRI parameters that were present uh, even prior to that lesion forming. And so these are some examples. So here is a patient who, on the third visit, had a lesion pop up. And we can track back on both the, uh, let's see, bright is uh, susceptibility and dark is R2 star. So we can go back and look at what was happening. Uh, and we can actually see uh, changes in myelination and changes in iron, which we relate to changes in macrophage activity prior to that lesion popping up. So we can actually learn something about the disease in vivo. We don't have to wait for pathology, of course. 
So another surprising finding, again, known 150 years ago, Charcot noticed that there were lesions in the gray matter, but we've never had a tool to be able to image those lesions in vivo uh, until the advent of 70 scanners. So they show this very nicely. So here is uh, a cortical lesion, what we would now call a type 3 lesion. Um, some other examples here. See them. That's a juxtacortical lesion. It's close to the cortex. And if you look carefully, take a look at this one, for example. You see dark lines in those? Those are central veins. So, you know, we could rule out stroke. We could rule out uh, various forms of, of sort of nondescript white matter disease and so on. And we could predict that this patient actually has MS. And it's not that the veins necessarily cause MS, in fact, I don't think they do, but we think they're the permissive environment that allows macrophages to actually extravasate. And that's why you get this ring of iron and macrophages around when you do the iron stain. So, what I've been talking to you so far is structure, ring anatomy for quantitative anatomy, okay? But MRI can also be used to look at brain function, okay? And there's some relationship between the two. Within the context of what I'm going to talk about, uh, we're going to look at the axons, which I've been talking about already, and the exchange of information on those axons between different brain areas. So the way I like to think about this is DTI and techniques, diffusion tensor imaging, uh, that show you tracks, axonal tracks, uh, tell you where the highways are. Okay? But we don't know whether there are cars on those highways and what direction those cars are going uh, unless we have some method of looking at the function or the information exchange of those axons. So here you can tell, uh, because we know uh, these are white, so we know those are headlights. And these are red, so we know those are taillights, so we can infer direction. Actually, an fMRI, a resting state fMRI, which I'm going to talk about, we can't quite do that yet. So we can't tell you the direction in which the information is flowing. Uh, but we can tell you something about how that information is flowing. So I think it is incumbent upon any speaker to convince you that they have a brain. And I usually find that I have to convince my students that I have a brain. So this is my brain. Uh, this is DTI at 7T at extremely high resolution. Um, your brains will look somewhat like this. If you're younger than me, you're going to have more synapses and more tracks, possibly. Um, but this is the highway, OK? And that highway sadly declines after the time you're about 20. So don't laugh too hard. It's happening to you. <laughs> so uh, the work I'm going to talk about for function is, is work that we've been doing, resting state fMRI, with my colleague Stefan Everling, for, for a decade now. Uh, talk about some of the recent work here. So again, all projects start with the appropriate RF coil and the appropriate hardware. Uh, so this is a 24-channel received coil, 8-channel transmit, that would be unique in the world. It allows us to make these really spectacular high-resolution maps, uh, images of uh, monkey in this case. Uh, and you can tell uh, the monkey brain looks very different than the rat brain that I was showing you previously. Lots of cell side and gyri. So this is done in our 70s scanner. And we can do DTI at very high resolution in these animals. And we can extract the tracts as well. I'm not going to dwell on that. I want to talk to you about resting state fMRI. So just as a reminder, the correlation between two signals is defined mathematically by, like this. Uh, pictorially, uh, let's say you have two signals that uh, co-oscillate together. Then they have a positive correlation value. And if they are opposite to each other, they would have a negative correlation value. Okay? So I'm going to show you lots and lots of correlation maps, so you just need to remember this simple picture. 
So this is work that Matt Hutchison did while he was a postdoc in Stefan's lab. Um, Matt is at Biogen now uh, as their imaging lead. So if you look at this image, you'll realize that it's not a static image. It's actually a full set of slices of the brain weighted to the bold signal. This is the signal we use in fMRI, the blood oxygenation level dependent signal. Uh, repeated every second. So we're covering the brain top to bottom every second. And you can see that it's flickering, OK? And you might think, oh, well, that's just noise. After all, you do repeated measures, you're going to get some noise. If you take a region, for example, in the frontal eye fields here, and look at it over time, well, indeed, it does look like noise, right? But if you take that signal and cross-correlate it against every other pixel in the brain, you actually get this, which is a map of correlation. So here is the frontal eye field in a monkey. It's actually at the intersection of the arcuate sulcus and the principal sulcus, right in there. And this is a map of what we believe this voxel is connected to in an information content manner, OK? And I'll show you why we believe that map to be correct later on. So that's one way to do resting state connectivity maps. We infer connectivity through correlation. Another way to do this um, that has been um, goes back quite a few years now with Vince Calhoun and, and uh, people like that, is the use of independent component analysis. So you can do blind source localization in a sense. You can identify independent networks um, that have been named here. So this is another paper of ours uh, showing these networks in primates, non-human primates. <laughs> and you can look at the connectivity between these different networks, so using graph theory and, and various other approaches. Actually, there are some very, very sophisticated approaches now. Um, so you can look at the strength of the correlation between networks uh, and what networks are connected to what other networks. Okay. So in the ocular motor system, if this is that map I showed you um, both as a flat map um, and then various surface, medial, and lateral views. This is in monkeys. This is the exact same experiment done in humans. Okay? And you can actually get very homologous maps. Oops. And the reason we know these to be true is we can look at some of the original horseradish peroxidase staining uh, track tracing approaches uh, from Herta and Cass and many others over the years. Uh, where you do an injection in that same region here in the frontal eye field, and then you wait a few weeks and you look at where the virus or the tracer goes. So when you have those maps, you can identify anatomic regions. So here are a bunch of them in the ocular motor system, and these are in the ventral premotor, and these are in white matter. So they're always a good control to have. And between any two regions, you can look at the strength of the correlation between them. And you can make a correlation matrix. This is in monkeys. This is in humans. The humans is much stronger because the monkeys are anesthetized and the humans are not. Okay, so anesthesia tends to drop the strength of the correlations, but it doesn't seem to change the structure of the maps. So a few years ago, Katie Chang and Gary Glover um, at Stanford did this sort of simple experiment where they looked at what's called the default mode network. This is kind of the, the mother of all resting state networks, uh, been shown with both PET and fMRI. And they looked at an area uh, in the frontal cortex, an area in the parietal cortex, uh, and looked at the time series of those two. And then they averaged the correlation over a sliding window like this. And what they showed is the correlation actually varied over time. This was something of a surprise initially. And a lot of people were critical of this study because these were awake humans. And of course, you put an awake human in a magnet, and their heads can move. They're thinking about their exam or their mortgage, or they need a double-double or whatever, right? So you know, brain networks can change. And so a lot of people said, well, this is just reflective of various covert thought processes that are going on. 
So we decided to see if there was anything to this by actually doing it in both awake humans, and we did it at 3T for them, and anesthetized monkeys, which we did at 7T. And those monkeys are head fixed, so there's absolutely no emotion, and they certainly are not thinking about their next exam. Okay? So here's that correlation matrix. And what you can do is, pairwise, you can look at the correlations over time. And when you do that, you can, they stack up like this. So this is in the output motor system, premotor, ventral premotor system, and this is in white matter. This is averaged over four minutes, and this is averaged over 30 seconds. And what you can see in these sort of uh, short-term averages, I guess we'll call them, are these periods of hypersynchrony uh, in terms of correlation, followed by periods where they are either asynchronous or they're negatively correlated. So it's not just random noise. If you look at it over a long window, like four minutes, you see the correlation values stay constant. That is effectively the value you get in your static map. And they're very similar between monkeys and humans. So here's the static map, but you can actually look at the correlation matrices as a function of a 30 second or 60 second, 120 or 240 second window. So this will be relatively static. You really need to go to about 10 minutes to get a static map. Uh, and you can see it resembles this quite a bit. But over shorter periods, we actually see oscillations in the correlation values. So this was published a couple of years ago again, and um, it was quite, quite a sort of revelation. So there's this entire field now, which I profess to know nothing about, which is looking at dynamic fluctuations in resting state networks, which have been shown to be meaningful in various um, sort of scenarios. And as you might expect, in almost every disease known to man, there are changes. Uh, so how specific they are, we don't know yet, but there certainly seems to be uh, something quite interesting in these. And these are, you know, slow compared to alpha rhythms and beta rhythms and things like that. And of course, you can also put these on the brain, and you can look at, so these are correlation maps of the right frontal eye field with every other voxel in the brain. Uh, over time. And again, this is average over four minutes, and this is a 30 second average. So this is essentially a brain, these are brain networks that are oscillating with, with relatively low frequency periods, but seem to be very important in, in things like memory and, and things, uh, even motor consolidation and, and things like that. So I want to show you one example of this, and we'll call it quits. So what do we know about resting state networks? So uh, we believe them to be neuronal uh, in origin. We're not entirely sure about the physiology um, in terms of the origin. We don't know whether these reflect uh, calcium or the action potentials or glial activity that's associated with neural activity and so forth. Um, what we do know is they're ubiquitous across species. And it's very likely that that means that they're a fun fundamental uh, property in the mammalian brains. Uh, what that property is, we have yet to elucidate. Uh, so I've done a couple of plots here. The plot a little bit out of date, but uh, I'm scared to see where that has gone to. But there are in excess of, of 1,500 resting state papers published a year now. So it's its own little subfield. Um, so let me show you an example um, in the last few minutes of how this can be used to track the neural substrates of behavior. And we'll call it a day at that point. So we all know about strokes and the fact that strokes uh, often come from a clot in a cerebral artery that gives rise to ischemia downstream of that clot. Many, many years ago, a uh, physician in Italy uh, actually introduced the concept of neglect for certain types of strokes that occurred in the frontal cortex. So if you had a stroke in your front left frontal cortex, uh, you actually had some form of spatial neglect in your right visual field. 
And the way they measured this in monkeys originally was they had the monkey focus on a fruit up here, then dangle some, a sugar cube, which monkeys love, and that monkey would actually not respond or make a saccade to that cube until it was almost directly in front of them. Okay. But over time, literally over weeks, that tends to recover, even though that tissue seems to be damaged permanently. And so uh, Peter Schiller and Ian Chu um, proposed that this recovery involved a posterior stream a secondary set of wiring mechanisms um, that exist both in non-human primate and in humans. It had never actually been proved. So we wanted to show um, how this network might reorganize during behavioral recovery um, after a stroke. So here is the task we use in the monkeys. We train them to fixate on the dot. And then we present them with uh, stimuli to the left or the right, but the stimuli are offset in time. So this one might come on first, or this one might come on first, and we can vary the time delay between them. If you imagine if they both show up at the same time, then the animals has a 50% chance of looking left or right. But if they occur at a substantial offset, the animal's likely to look at the one that comes on first. Okay. So it's a free choice. So um, if the onset is zero, or the asynchrony is zero, then what you expect is a 50-50 chance of looking leftwards or, or rightwards. Okay. While as if the left target comes on 300 milliseconds before the right target, then, you know, almost always the animal will look to the left, okay? This is how we're probing the behavior. So there are many different models of experimental stroke uh, in monkeys. We actually use uh, endothelin-1 because it mimics the human condition um, very closely. What you get is a stroke that lasts for a few hours and then resolves. And so you can see that here. Here are injections. Um, so this wasn't our work. This is the first paper reporting this model. Four injections of endothelin. You can see that you, uh, there's vasoconstriction here. And then it resolves. Okay, that 190 minutes, that's 70 minutes. So we did this in a few animals. Uh, we did multiple injections in two sites. Again, at the arcuate and the principal sulcus. So trying to get the frontal eye feel. We do MRI, since we happen to have a few of those. Uh, we can actually identify the lesion site very precisely. And of course, we can do angiography, so we can establish that we have a blood flow interruption. So, so now let's look at what happens in these stroked out animals. So remember, this is what it should look like. This is what happens at week one. So there's this you have to present a stimulus on the left side 200 milliseconds ahead of the right side in order to get the animal to make a saccade to the left, okay? So essentially, this is a model of neglect. They're, they're ignoring that left hemifield unless you present the object way, way ahead of the opposite side, the contralateral side. And then, week two, week three, week four, week eight. Okay, so this is the recovery that we know happens in humans, and that we've shown also occurs in the monkeys. So what does this look like from an imaging fMRI perspective? So here's the frontal eye field where we did the injections, and that's what the time course looks like pre-stroke, that's the contralateral frontal eye field. You can see that they're oscillating in synchrony. I don't have to show you anything sophisticated there. If you look at this node in the parietal cortex, you can actually see that that too is oscillating in synchrony with the left and right frontal eye fields. Okay? And that is completely reflective of the maps that we have previously obtained. So one week after stroke, there's the time course out of the frontal eye field again. 
You can see it's completely asynchronous with the contralateral hemisphere. However, the contralateral hemisphere and the ipsilateral posterior uh, region here are still oscillating together. So we can quantitate this through using some maps uh, or atlases of parcellation and looking at ROIs to develop uh, graph theory analysis. It's actually very simple. So here is all the connected networks in that parcellation uh, in week one, uh, minus the pre-stroke baseline. This is a week four, and week uh, four minus week one again. So what you see is, over time, there is an increase, this is a positive correlation, there's an increase in strength in the connectivity in the ipsilateral to the stroke side of the resting state connectivity. Okay. This is exactly what Peter Schiller and I Han Shu had predicted, that the secondary path that goes through the superior colliculus would take over the function. So here you have an example of mapping the neural substrates of behavior using resting state fMRI, no task involved, with the resting state, um, or with the behavior itself. So um, I think I actually managed to almost catch us up here. So this is the team that works on resting state um, in the lab. Some are gone, and there's some new additions as well. And uh, I think that's all I want to say. Thanks very much. Thanks, Larry. That was an amazing um, overview of a wide range of topics, but I think illuminated um, in the real life what, what you really do in the lab. So we have a few minutes for questions. Don. Ravi, I'm, I'm thinking more back to the first part of your talk, mm -hmm. where you were talking about iron regulation. Really great to see you incorporating that kind of biology. Actually, um, uh, macrophages and iron regulation are telling for inflammatory changes, to be sure. So uh, a couple questions related to that. One is, is there any evidence of extracellular iron deposits in NS? No, actually. Okay. So, so uh, good, it narrows it down. It all seems to be cellular. Yep. And then the next one is, um, you know, veins are everywhere. So what about the size of vein that connects with your lesions? Is there I mean, so that's a, it's an interesting point. So it's, if you use various sort of vein sensitive sequences, as you go higher in field, you realize that the veins are in fact everywhere. That's right. But there's something actually very special about the veins in MS. They actually tend to run along the long axis of the ovoid lesions, um, which almost mechanistically makes sense. So you, you've created some kind of ellipsoidal permissive environment where these uh, macrophages can extravasate, essentially. And so something very stereotypical about that, as opposed to just finding veins you know, in a scattering approach. So there's something about the geometry that, that is preserved even though there are veins everywhere. So is MS formally recognized as an inflammatory I know there's all kinds of things going on, like demyelination. That uh, yeah, so interestingly, so MS was always called an autoimmune disease until actually just the last few years, okay. where it is now called a neuroinflammatory disease. So people are looking at B cell and T cell responses in MS, and actually the degree to which it is a B or T cell response actually seems to determine the progression of the disease and the responsiveness to the various drugs that have been developed. So almost all the current drugs that are being investigated are neuroinflammatory modulators. They're not autoimmune modulators anymore, which beta interferon was. Right, those areas overlap, but Yeah, they overlap, but that, there is, a, there is a dis quite a significant distinction when you're actually trying to cure or, or, or arrest it. Well, one from me. Um, clearly, 7T is not going to become 
standard of care for a long time, if, if ever. But to what extent can you talk about using what you find at 72 to inform advances at 3T? Um, so in other words, at 72 you, you find stuff that you had no idea existed, then use that information to refine your techniques at 3T. Yeah, so we've done quite a bit of that. Actually, we did it sort of backwards. We actually did a lot of this stuff originally at 3T, found correlations that were suggestive of things that we, then when we looked very carefully at 7T, we understood it better, essentially. So we used 7T to understand what we were seeing at 3T. And 3T is not as sensitive as this, but it may be sufficient for the vast majority of things that we're doing. We don't always need resolution, uh, but we usually need contrast. So to the extent that one can make 3T images with the right contrast, uh, or do some clever post-processing, um, there is, I think, a lot of hope that 3T can be used for some of these things. So you can do QSM at 3T very nicely. Uh, and even though the resolution isn't as good as 7T, it doesn't matter. As I've shown you, you don't, actually don't need that resolution for certain applications. Um, so we've published some of that work already. Well, please join. Oh, sorry, one more. One more last question. Uh, the point you were talking about uh, dynamic functional connectivity, and then there was a trend that uh, the connectivity matrix changes from time to time. Yeah. Uh, has there been any study on to inspect whether that trend changes from person to person or for, for the same individual from time to time? So, um, yes, sort of. So there is a paper out of Yale that, that was published last year in Nature Neuroscience that actually showed that the, resting, the dynamics of the resting state connectivity um, were as good as a fingerprint to identify a person. So they had test, retest, uh, the same person over multiple days um, and then classify all that and they showed that your your brain's resting state connectivity defines who you are um, in, a so, in a dynamic fashion so that makes it very complicated actually because you can't just have an atlas of, of connectivity and say this is normal because that's can't be done um, you could average over a long period and there would be some some normality, but that's not what distinguishes a person. So it's the dynamics of the connectivity that distinguishes the person. Okay. So please join me in thanking Rabbi Ultimate.